great to be here tonight. Um, uh, I'm Jim Sellen with VHB. VHB is a multidisciplinary planning and urban design and civil engineering and environmental science firm uh, with about 13 offices on the east coast of Florida. And we have been really privileged to be involved with the program and the speaker series. Um, the university has a very gifted set of instructors in the uh, Graduate School of Planning and some great students. Uh, and we're really excited about being able to be involved with them and to sponsor uh, some of these uh, programs. Mary Ann mentioned um, the programs that are coming up. The next one is going to feature uh, Dr. Jane Quinn, who's uh, uh, with the Children's Aid Society. She's assistant director. Uh, with the National Center for Community Schools. And as Dr. Frumpkin mentioned, that's a real focus for um, what we think is a very important aspect of redevelopment in certain areas of our community. And uh, we think it's a, a really good topic uh, to uh, investigate uh, with our speaker series. The third uh, part of the speaker series we're actually still working on, but it's going to be on homelessness. And of course, with the recent announcement by Florida Hospital in the city of Orlando and Orange County and the, the dedication of some pretty significant dollars to dispersing homelessness and dealing with homelessness, we think that's going to be a, a very important topic also. Um, so we're really excited about the series. And I'm really excited about tonight because I think it's going to be a, a really great program. I get to introduce our facilitator, uh, Lisa Portelli, who has really understated her qualifications here, but I'm going to try and do my best to, to, to embellish them. Um, but Lisa has been involved in nonprofit programs since 1986. She was probably 12 years old at the time, and has a background that gives her a unique perspective on issues affecting the working poor. And uh, uh, Lisa began her work in affordable housing and homelessness in Central Florida and moved to Jacksonville where she is, uh, was a dire executive director of the I.M. Schultzbacher Center wow, for the Homeless. And upon her return to uh, Central Florida, she was director of the workforce uh, centers, uh, heading up the implementation of welfare reform in our area. And for the past 12 years, she's been a program director with the Winter Park uh, Health Foundation, overseeing grant portfolios focused on the success of health care for the um, uninsured and community health. And she's also, uh, and most importantly to us, an adjunct professor at UCF uh, teaching planning healthy communities and volunteerism in nonprofit management. Um, she's on a lot of boards. She's on Walkable and Livable Communities Institute, uh, Bike Walk Central Florida, which by the way does a great job, Winter Park Chamber of Commerce, uh, Metro Plan Orlando Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, has worked with Eatonville and their town council to represent the town's interest in more walkable uh, and bikeable region. Uh, so has served on the Governor's Commission on Homelessness, the Florida Coalition for the Homeless, the Florida Housing Coalition, and the Orlando Neighborhood Improvement Corporation. How you have time for this, Lisa, I have no idea. But Lisa has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Don't you know? OK. <laughs> and uh, a master's in public administration from UCF, and is an avid cyclist, runner, and Ironman triathlete, who can be seen commuting on bike and sunrail most days. So Lisa, thank you for doing this. Yes, and since my mother from Wisconsin is in town, I only wish she would have been here to hear that introduction. I think she would have said, somebody made that up, I'm sure. So thank you very much. And it is so appropriate to be here at Florida Hospital and to be able to thank them for joining in promoting solutions to homelessness. It was a $6 million over three year contribution. So we're sitting here in Florida Hospital with another organization beginning to work on that cause. So I wanted to start though, because um, most people most people know me in my role of program director at the Health Foundation and at UCF, but that last 25 years or since 1986, um, a little about me. I did, as Jim said, I worked in affordable housing, homelessness, welfare reform, workforce, access to health care, all issues affecting um, the working poor and people in poverty my entire career. For the past 12 years, I've been an advocate for healthy communities at Winter Park Health. 
but a little about me that I hope frames our discussion for tonight, um, why poverty is impacting health in ways different than before. Um, for all intents and purposes, I grew up economically disadvantaged. I was the youngest of five in Wisconsin with two parents working in blue collar jobs, and I, when I went and looked up the income level that they were at, we would have qualified. That's sort of interesting because I don't really remember having a, such a politically correct term as economically disadvantaged. We just thought we were broke and we were perfectly happy that way in many ways. But times were different and life was different. And I think as I walk you through some of that and why Appleton, Wisconsin was a different place to grow up in, a traditional community design, I think by the end of tonight and by the end of the series, you'll understand the connections to that. Um, uh, so our, why was Appleton different? Our streets were safe. We walked and I rode my bike everywhere. Um, we had plenty of parks and neighbors who kept an eye out on us. Every bar in town, okay, this was Wisconsin, every bar in town sponsored a sports team and I played on all of them at little or no cost. Um, mom had coffee with the neighbors so there was no getting away with anything. Yes, she had time to have coffee with the neighbor because she could work part time and still afford the necessities. Neighbors talked, they were connected and my community was not gated nor was my yard even fenced. Um, my school was small, I had role models, and the social norms of society were evident to me or I was sternly reminded that I had violated them. Grocery stores were easy to access, we had a garden in our backyard, and the community offered many opportunities for activity and socialization, even in the winter. But if you can follow, if you can follow all that mattered toward my health, if you can't follow all that, I think you will by the end of tonight and understand why my, even though we grew up in many, you know, by all definitions, economically disadvantaged, it didn't impact my health nor my family's health in the way that is impacting people today. Things have changed. So it's a university distinguished lecture series. We'll start with a definition. If you're not familiar with Ruby, Frame, Ruby Payne's work, get familiar because she's got some phenomenal insight into the issue. Um, but it's simple. Um, and she's a great leader on the topic. But she goes into, she references resources. And you know what, what these are, but some are often forgotten when we focus on the financial needs to buy goods and services. But all are important resources and all can and will impact health. Look at the items in black. These are the area of us where all of us can have an impact on the effects of poverty simply by getting involved in someone's life. The knowledge of hidden rules, helping someone understand social norms. But these are all of the resources that she means that can really make someone be defined as living in poverty. And it's important not to just look at the financial. So a definition of health. This most famous modern definition of health was actually created by the World Health Organization and adopted in 1946. A state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. But I took the same um, list that we had under definition of health and applied those barriers under complete well-being. And look at it. Is what is lacking the same as what is lacking for health? While physical health is the most obvious and detrimental to daily life, any of these things that are out of balance or missing can and will affect health. So if poverty is to the extent to which you do without these resources, health is the extent to which you manage without them too. Tonight's discussion is about how a community, the built environment, and the support systems put in place can impact health and support a, support a person in their desire to live a healthy lifestyle. I'm also going to be able to start with some data and really pleased to be able to um, unveil. This is brand new 2014 data recently released um, that was completed by the professional research consultants in partnership with all the organizations that you see up there. This is a community health needs assessment and I'm using regional data from our area. So um, just real quickly, this is, as I said, regional data for all four of those counties, Brevard, Orange, Osceola, and Seminole. And they did telephone surveys of just over 2,000 adults, 2001 to be exact, in East Central Florida. This survey was actually completed in 2004, 2009, and 2014. And when it is released, all of that is available on the Winter Park Health Foundation website, as well as the other partner sites and other areas in the community. But we've got some great data to quickly look at. The population and survey sample characteristics, the researchers did a great job of matching um, our population to 
the survey sample. And if you look at, look at the yellow arrow way over on the side, and at less than 200% of federal poverty level, the orange box shows that the actual population, we have about 37.2% of the people in our community living at or below 200% of federal poverty level, which for those of you who aren't familiar is $47,700 for a family of four annually. So we have 37% of people living at that rate. Um, the survey sample size was 36.5, so we did a, a great job in terms of matching that. Look at the yellow arrow again pointing to a bar that 42.7% 42 of the people who live at a very low income level experience fair or poor, poor health. This was a telephone survey and self-disclosed by their definition. Do you feel you have fair or poor health? Look at that number. And the low income number is 26% of people living at fair or poor, uh, believing they have fair or poor overall health. The middle and high income is 9.3%. So that's almost four and a half times a middle or high income person reporting fair or poor health compared to a very low income person in East Central Florida. We've gotten this narrowed down by county and otherwise too. I could almost quit right there, but I won't. Um, I'm gonna go into it just a little bit further. Although obesity is not the only measure of health, it, they clearly affect health outcomes. And we look at very low income population with 40.5% living with obesity and 35.9% struggling with uh, a low income struggling with obesity. And then we look at an almost 30% on middle and high income. You see, again, a disparity amongst the low income populations. However, given that almost 30% of the middle and high income residents struggle with it and presumably have access to things low income people may not, we begin to see how our community has engineered activity out of all of our lives. This is an issue that crosses all economic areas, and we've got a lot of the work that we could do to change our community could impact people at all levels and improve health and lower health care costs everywhere else. This isn't just about knowing the right thing to do or having access to do it, but it does say the work in the health can work could improve health everywhere. I'm gonna go a little quicker. Prevalence of diabetes, 22.0% of low-income people with diabetes compared to 10.5% for middle and high. Again, the yellow arrow should be drawing you to where I'm referencing. Um, prevalence of high blood cholesterol, this slide demonstrates the complexity of the issue. Here you see the same percentage across the income levels. However, these rates, however, these rates may be the same, but a low-income person will suffer from worse outcomes as a result of their lack of access to care the cost of care, healthy food access, and affordable prescription treatments for high cholesterol. So it is definitely an issue though that, um, the stroke numbers, these look like such tiny little percentages and thankfully they are, yet you see that very low and low income persons suffer from stroke at twice the rate of middle and high. This data is consistent with data for other chronic diseases. More than double, here we are. Find it somewhat, very or somewhat difficult to buy affordable fresh produce. Almost 50% of very low income people and 45% of low income people. This could be solved through better planning. This is a community design issue. We have created food deserts, commonly defined as an area where a person does not have access to a full service grocery store within a half mile of their home. And why are these planning issues? Well, we've created neighborhoods that have become essentially pockets of poverty and grocery stores can't make any money by locating there. So the Publix is not in certain areas of our community is because the market demand is not there and they can't put a store there because they can't make money. And we've got to turn that situation around and either provide access through the corner grocery stores that are there or provide incentives to bring um, full service grocery stores into those communities. 20 to 30 percent of our people, 20 to 30 percent of people in our region report no leisure time physical activity in the past month. But when you look at this one, that it's 30, almost 39 percent say the main reason is that they don't have time. This further validates the need to make opportunities to be active have to be easy. We need the simple things. We need sidewalks. We need bike lanes or specialized infrastructure. We need trails. We need lights on our basketball courts that are right in our neighborhood at night and parks because people don't have time. So um, optimistic here. I really liked this one. I was, um, I think it's surprising for most people I, that about 28% of very low income people use a local park or trail for walking, running, or biking at least weekly. A higher percentage of low income do, 36.8%, and a lower on mid and high, using a local park or trail for walking, running, or biking at least weekly. 
The bottom line here is that this is why Metro Plan, the Florida Department of Transportation, Orange County, many of the municipalities, and the Winter Park Health Foundation are focused on improving trail and park and infrastructure systems to make all of these things more accessible. If you build it, they will come. I'm out on the West Orange Trail at least once or twice a month. The parking lots are full. If you don't get there before 9 o'clock in the morning out to Winter Garden, you can't park in the parking lot at the Winter Garden Station. It's crowded. So people are looking and hungry for those places where they can go and be active, where they do feel safe. Um, and then the last, I'm almost done. Um, the people who believe that a neighborhood is slightly not safe, um, slightly or not at all safe, Almost 47% of very low income people believing it's not safe to go out for a walk or not safe to go out. So that's a huge barrier and another issue. You look at the low income levels also and then see how much reduced that is for middle and high. The stranger danger campaigns of our, of our childhood and the missing child on the milk carton campaign, those have been pointed to as the impetus behind the current crisis of childhood obesity that parents feel that they need to keep their child in, stay home and watch TV until I get home from work because I don't feel that you're safe. My mom said, go outside and play until I whistle for you and don't come back until then, <laughs> you know, go out. So this is an entirely different world that they're living in. And then finally, 41% um, of um, very low income people saying that cost prevented a physician visit within the last year, 34% of low income, and you see the obvious, you know, access issues easier for middle and high. So some really interesting data. Um, finally, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the higher a person's education, attainment, and income, the more likely that person is to have a longer life expectancy. They've done some phenomenal mapping, and I hope to get a map done of our area, where they show the differences in life expectancy based on zip code. And they are now boldly making the statement that they can predict how long you will live based on your zip code alone and how sad that is. But that is where they have proven the impacts of health in pockets of poverty and in zip codes where there is primarily a very low income person and its effect on life expectancy. There's some other tough statistics in that. Babies born to mothers who did not finish high school are nearly twice as likely to die before their first birthday as babies born to a college graduate. Children in poor families are about seven times as likely to be in poor or fair health as children in the highest income families. And children whose parents did not finish high school are more than six times as likely to be in poor or fair health as children of parents who earned a college degree. So how does community design play into this and what effect does it have? It's important to recognize that the residents of communities with high level of poverty often have less access to places where they can be physically active, such as parks, green spaces, bike paths, et cetera, even well-lit sidewalks. If you look at the yellow arrow again that I keep using to point out, um, Teens who live in poor or mostly minority neighborhoods are 50% less likely to have a recreational facility near their home. And then look over to, I guess, your left. Um, 50, people who live near trails are 50% more likely to meet physical activity guidelines. Again, if it's easy and accessible, people will use it. Um, the built environment does matter. And I'm not going to go into all of these. I think I'm actually burning up more of my time than I'm supposed to. Um, but the the cities are working to undo the damage of our car-centric design by making streets and sidewalks and public spaces more welcoming for residents. More research is needed to understand the complex relationships between community level factors and health. But the last thing I want to reference is that in 2011, there was a New England Journal of Medicine paper, and many of you probably have heard of it, Jens, Jens Ludwig and co-authors did a trial, and they issued vouchers to low-income residents in public housing, and they received HUD vouchers to relocate to different higher-income neighborhoods and to a control group. A decade later, low-income individuals in the intervention group had lower rates of obesity and diabetes compared to control group participants, thus underscoring the importance of neighborhood poverty in determining diabetes-related health outcomes. Pretty important study and a lot more work like that going on. So it is now my pleasure to introduce my privilege to introduce Anna Ricklin, our speaker tonight, our distinguished lecturer who has come down from the cold north <laughs> happily to join us tonight. Um, Anna is the manager of planning and, and planning and community health center at the American Planning Association. Anna has a background in public health, transportation planning, and nutrition, and is an emerging leader in applied research, strategic planning, and coalition building for healthy communities. She has worked in the fields of health impact assessment, community outreach, and active transportation, including transit and bicycle planning. 
In 2011, Anna joined APA with the aim of bringing together all aspects of planning to support public health. She has an MHS from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a BA in Anthropology from American University. She lives in Washington, D.C. But from the info I gleaned off her Facebook page, I say she loves to be outdoors, loves playing with cats, and maybe a little bit of tactical urbanism. Thanks for traveling down, Anna. Hi, good evening, everybody. So, uh, so I can get a sense of the room, how many folks are uh, align themselves with the field of planning? So most people. How many align themselves with the field of health, whether it be medical or nursing or public health? OK, wonderful. So um, yeah, so I'm here tonight to talk about how my work is connecting to planning and public health and what the American Planning Association is doing to advance public health in our country uh, among our members and of course hopefully affecting the people that our members are working for in, in communities across the US where two thirds of our members are actually working for the public sector and about a third working for the private sector for other types of organizations. So um, ideally I like to think that my work is having a direct impact on on the public. So beginning with a definition of what is a healthy community, this is a, a definition that was just recently this year put together by a group called the California Planning Roundtable, which is made up of all of the planning rock stars in the state of California, and they meet quarterly and have power conversations about what is the future of planning for the state of California, and California is an important leader in this field. And they put together a sort of succinct definition of what is a healthy community. But looking at the bottom, I like the concluding sentence most of all because it declares that a vibrant, livable, and inclusive community provides example ample choices and opportunities to thrive economically, environmentally, and culturally, but must begin with health. And it, goes back to that old adage that if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And that can be scaled up to a neighborhood, that can be scaled up to a whole city, that can be scaled up to our whole country. If we don't have our health, we don't have anything. And we know that the data is beginning to show that the rates of obesity, the rates of chronic disease are actually undermining our country's ability to succeed economically, militarily, uh, et cetera. So we need to think about where that begins and how we can intervene at the earliest stages, and that includes, of course, infrastructure in the built environment. This is a model of the social determinants of health, which I really like to look at because it couches the individual who is made up of her genetic material and the food she eats at the center of a sphere of influences that includes the family, the neighborhood, the schools, the economy of this town that she lives in, and all the way out to the broader impacts of the world economy and the forces that are happening in the world. We're talking about this today, and this is just a quick aside, we're talking about this today as it affects um, folks in Florida and in the United States, but we have to also think about these same issues, the crossover of planning and public health as they affect people in countries all over the world. And so um, we're all living in a global ecosystem, especially when we start talking about the food system, you immediately are taking yourself into places far, far, far away from where we are now, from uh, the sources of where we get our food. So we're, we're living in that sphere, all of us, and so I think it's um, important for us to think about. So there's a lot of circles in these first few slides. We like circles in planning. Um, as, since a lot of you are planners, you're very familiar with these different areas of planning, um, everything from community development to urban design to transportation, and we've thrown health in there too. How many people have heard of the National Prevention Strategy? Has it trickled down to some folks? I like to think of the National Prevention Strategy as a comprehensive plan for health. It has these different categories, one of which very firmly relates to us, health and safety in community in the top left. Um, it's put out by the Surgeon General's Office, which of course is part of the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level. And it outlines all the different ways that 
partners from the police force to the school system to the planners to elected officials and everybody in between can affect health and improve health in communities. And it's really aimed, even though it's a document that is a comprehensive plan for health at the national scale, it's framed to improve health locally. And uh, the American Planning Association has been working with the Surgeon General's office as well as other partners in trying to figure out ways to activate and implement components of the goals of this plan to our members and help them understand the connections between what their work is and national aims. So we have some data too. It's a little bit more on the qualitative side um, with advice and recommendations for the quantitative side. So we did a three-year study recently with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, looking at comprehensive plans that planners make and seeing what they include for public health. The data is getting a little bit old now um, some of our plans were passed as late as 2011, but we don't have any updates since then. We could redo the study, but I don't think it's necessary because I think that a lot of places are starting to include health goals, policies, objectives in their plans more and more, and that's what we're hearing about more and more. But the first stage was a survey, and we asked folks, what are the different topics of public health related directly or related to public health that you include in your comprehensive plan. And the ones in yellow are the ones we saw the most often, but some of these other terms are other terms that we learned were, were being included in comprehensive plans. And then we also asked, does the plan have a standalone health element as well? And overall we found that the plans that had strong coverage of public health had a health element, but we also saw lots of plans that were really great that had infused public health goals into each section. But then we actually went and read the plan, which if anybody wants to volunteer on my next study to read 22 comprehensive plans, I'm taking all volunteers. Um, I did enlist some help from uh, students. So we developed a framework uh, for public health topics that to look for within plans. Um, identifying common goals and policies as well as identifying what was not present in those plans because we wanted to see what was covered but also identify the gaps and think about what are recommendations that we could see for future planning. And then we also wanted to see if these were supported by implementation mechanisms. Were these just great ideas and, and lofty goals, but were they actually supported by timelines and identifying roles and responsibilities of different actors and agencies and partners to implement? Were they, was funding allotted for these plans? <laughs> these, are the, these are the 22 plans that we read. Um, some of them were sustainability plans, kind of taking into thought that sustainability planning is, in a sense, the new comprehensive planning in some places and can be seen as uh, a more evolved version of comprehensive planning, potentially. And then the ones with the star are the ones that contain a public health element independently. And this is the evaluation tool that I developed. And a lot of thought went into this, of course, but one of the main reasons that it is framed with public health topics was because this is a public health evaluation. So um, each category, except for the broad issues category, which was looking at general readability and understanding of the plan itself, as well as uh, looking at ancillary documents that were included or any other data that was included, um, all of the other categories were framed to really zone in on public health topics. So active living were, Plan, did these plans include specific components related to active transport, recreation, injury prevention? Did they mention health and human services, access to care? Was that included? Was a consideration of aging included? Um, all of these things were things that we looked at and scored the plans on. So briefly going through some of the strengths and weaknesses or areas for improvement that um, we found in the plan. So active living was the most strongly represented health category across plans. This wasn't a super surprise, but it's really nice to see because as Lisa was just talking about, we've tended to engineer active living out of live, our lives and communities. So that was wonderful to see. And then environmental health was um, the second most represented topic and particularly it regarded um, clean air and water and one of the ways that 
they suggested having clean air and water was planting trees, which we like to see anywhere that can support trees. Um, and emergency preparedness was strong and very specific when included. So we were looking for the specificity of the goals and objectives. Were the plans um, just, again, very general and, and broad, or were, this, were, were they policies that if you were to try to implement them, you could do it because they were specific enough? And emergency preparedness was one of those areas. And actually, the, um, the plan from North Miami, Florida, was one of the plans that was very specific about emergency preparedness, probably because they've experienced a number of emergencies. Um, places that haven't experienced a lot of emergencies didn't seem to think it was a super important topic. But areas for improvement. We did find that plans that included food systems planning policy were really good about it. But when they didn't include it, it wasn't to be found. So that was an area that we thought, along with emergency preparedness, really needed to have some more teeth. Um, and very weak coverage of health and human services, access to care, and social health, social cohesion, and mental health. Only one plan we read had the term mental health in the entire plan. So very much illustrating that mental health is a topic that planners aren't thinking about. Planners aren't thinking that it's an area that they have an influence on, um, or even that stakeholders are coming to the table and saying, mental health is an issue that we want to see addressed in our comprehensive plan. And in fact, that's why it was covered in that one plan that we saw it. And we learned later when we did some case studies and talked to the planners themselves that the reason mental health was in the plan was because of the stakeholders making sure that it was. Um, and then to relate this to our theme tonight, I wanted to highlight the issues of um, data and the use of data and the application of data in planning, which possibly in some of the attending documents to the comprehensive plan, there obviously was a lot of community assessment that goes into any comprehensive planning process in any community, but it wasn't illustrated in the plan how they came up with the policies and objectives. So not to say that every plan has to include a decision-making process per se, but it wasn't in the introductory remarks for each element, for example, or for the introductory remarks for each subsection within that element, it wasn't explained how or why they were prioritizing some goals and not others. And so the inclusion of data um, and maps and images that would illustrate that data were something that we saw was lacking and I think really needs to be included in comprehensive plans and every other plan that flows from it to show why particular policies and goals are being prioritized over others. And in particular, of course, I would like to see and we would like to see here an inclusion of health data as the basis. So I just mentioned that specifically health data would include these subcategories, crash or injury data, um, chronic disease rates, crime, et cetera. We know that planners are looking at some of this information. Probably not a lot of them are including health data just yet, but they're probably looking at socioeconomic data, um, possibly injury data or crash data, but sometimes those things are very siloed and that's the realm of the transportation department. So want to see more integration there. Um, and then when it comes to implementation, how are you going to implement if you haven't identified metrics or benchmarks um, or indicators that you're going to measure against? So none of the comprehensive plans we read really had those included. So then as I mentioned, we went and did some case studies. We called up people, we interviewed, we had some great interviews with planners from communities around the United States. Uh, I had a list here, I think I took the slide out with the list of the communities that we talked to, but um, these, all of them were included in that list of 22. Um, these are the key findings and sort of themes that came out of that more in-depth research. Um, and again, focusing a little bit on the data side because I think that when it comes to addressing poverty, ad addressing inequalities of health, that data can be our friend in showing why, where, how, to address some of those things. Data can spur action. Ad activists and advocates have known this for a long time. You put out a really persuasive report summarizing a lot of the data, just like Lisa just did um, before I spoke. Summarizing some of the key data re related to your aim, I think, can be a very persuasive way to get 
people's attention and to prioritize the different areas that you want to look at. And the health departments are doing this. Uh, you know, health departments, most of them are doing community health needs assessments work. Um, it just isn't tied together with the comprehensive planning process or the neighborhood or area planning process. And we need to think about ways to cross those barriers between, if it's if we're talking at the municipal level, between those departments and actually translate the data. And I have a couple of examples later on about how to do that. So um, here's, here's a neat example from Grand Rapids, which is one of the cities that I spoke to when doing this research. And one of the wonderful things I liked about their plan, which I think everybody should look at as a wonderful model of a comprehensive plan, is that it identified for every single section and goal in their plan, they identified the environmental, economic, and quality of life benefits. So it wasn't that they had a separate chapter addressing health. Health was woven throughout the plan. Quality of life, of which health is a component, was woven throughout that plan. And the, and the language of the plan really spoke to that and really made very clear that they had had a robust community involvement process. When we spoke to the director of planning, she said by the end of their two or three year comprehensive planning process, she said you could hear the word Green Grand Rapids, which is the name of their plan, spoken by a lot of regular citizens on the street. You could ask somebody what it was and people were familiar with it. And that's a wonderful outcome unto itself, um, but the fact that it included quality of life in there would hope that a lot of those citizens not only being aware of the plan would also be aware of how planning relates to their quality of life. And then Grand Rapids also used that opportunity, that um, comprehensive planning process to collect baseline data. They did a tree survey and they found out where all the trees were in the city. And so they could actually know their baseline of tree canopy so that when they had a goal and the funding and support to plant trees, they knew where they were going and they could track those trees. And this is a, a nice before and after story from Grand Rapids where they leverage stormwater management dollars along with uh, investments in their park and recreation department to overhaul this park in a disadvantaged part of town that had been sort of a blighted area. It had been an area where unhappy things were happening. People didn't let their kids go outside and play because it was unsafe. Um, they totally revamped it. You can see that now there's a splash pad and some wonderful ways for kids to interact. It's increased social cohesion. It's increased um, neighborhood excitement, happiness around the neighborhood. Um, it gives everybody, it has a space for everybody to hang out in. And you can see there's, it's just in a neighborhood. There's houses around the edges. It's not in a commercial area. It's an amenity for the locals. Uh, coming out of this, coming out of that research, after we talked to a bunch of people, we found out who their partners were. Not only, by the way, were a lot of them funded by um, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention ACA dollars, which is kind of interesting, um, but they also had partners across government agencies. And here's a list of them. Um, regarding the data component, I think that schools and health departments are some of the best sources for data. Um, and then Regarding non-governmental partners, foundations we heard were some very important partners. For example, in the Grand Rapids example, a foundation was the organization that supported the tree da data collection and the tree planting initiative. So when it came to implementation, even though they hadn't necessarily included all of these components in their plan, we found out where are you at with implementation? This has been a couple, three, five years since you adopted this plan. What's been going on? So um, Raleigh had adopted a new unified development code. They actually required sidewalks on both sides of the street in most developments at particular widths, which was wonderful to see. Um, Grand Rapids had painted 20 suit 27 new miles of bike lanes and had plans to paint more. I've probably painted more since I talked to them. Um, Philadelphia had a couple of, of neat um, policies that they'd implemented. One of them was to um, support climate change by reducing the sizes of buildings, essentially. And similarly with Dubuque, they put green roofs on a lot of their municipal buildings when they renovated them and turned their fleets over to hybrid vehicles. And then the second one from Philadelphia is instead of having an opt-in policy where the city would say, 
uh, do you want us to plant a tree here? And then just wait for the homeowner to reply. They went the other way and they said, uh, we're going to plant a tree here unless you say no. And most homeowners didn't say anything, so they're planting trees right and left. <clears throat> so obviously, coming out of this, we think that there needs to be more cross-pollination of professional influence in health departments with planners going over to health departments and helping them work on the more land use, GIS realm. Um, and the same on the other side, having public health professionals like myself working in built environment divisions, talking about ways that we can think about health from the very beginning of a planning process, no matter what planning process you're doing. It doesn't have to be a comprehensive plan. It can be any aspect of planning and any aspect of uh, community development decision making. Um, obviously, we have other stakeholders to think about when it comes to bodies like the Planning Commission or elected officials. Having ongoing working groups that are in place and ready to begin when an issue comes up that, say, a new mayor is elected and all of a sudden that mayor wants to institute a, a climate change um, disaster initiative and this working group has already been meeting and can bring to the table the important knowledge of knowing where the vulnerable populations are living, the people that will be the most impacted potentially if there is a disaster, that kind of thing. Um, having those things ongoing is really great, having those relationships built so that when you need them you can call upon them and you don't have to scramble. And then um, ensuring that all of the policies that flow from the comp plan keep the health theme. It's not forgotten. If it is in the comp plan, for example, as in the case of the research I'm talking about, that when you go to redo your zoning code, that health theme isn't forgotten. That when you're looking at site plan review or uh, subdivision regulations, that public health is included there. A few recommendations on data. Um, obviously, compiling data from as many places as possible using indicators, as mentioned before. And then um, we also found that when jurisdictions had included health data and related types of data, socioeconomic data, in funding applications, they had gotten funded to do cool projects. So data has some very quantifiable uses in the end as well. So for all the planners in the room, planning is really a convening field. This is one of the things I've discovered by working at APA and being a, a planner on TV, as I actually am on TV tonight, which is kind of neat, um, being a public health person in real life. But planners are the, are the professionals that bring together stakeholders from all the different areas, whether it be a community group or a hospital organization or the public health department or other people from the outside who can talk about how they're doing it in their town and they're trying to show the community how they can do it in their town. Planners are the people that are doing that. There's nobody else really within the governmental structure who's doing, having that role um, of bringing together all the stakeholders because planners have an impact on the entire system that makes up a jurisdiction and whether it be the streets or the buildings or deciding how to reuse those buildings or reuse those plots. So think about that when, when you're out being a planner. I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity to build relationships. I mentioned working groups already, um, the flow of policies down from the comprehensive plan, et cetera. And then how are you choosing to um, spend your dollars? Are you, when you go to have a capital improvement plan, is the capital improvement plan prioritizing the uh, implementation of some of those goals and policies that were identified through a robust process uh, in the places that are most in need. And then, of course, tracking and evaluation to find out what you did, how you did it. So APA um, developed a process model for planning and public health. This is a very general idea, sort of framed on the uh, public health's logic model uh, framework. Um, looking at how the mission and purpose goes into each stage of developing the comprehensive plan and how that information is looped back to the beginning after you've done it for a while and you can see what the outcomes are and it goes back into the mission which is to update your comprehensive plan and update all of your different components that flow from that. 
And this is included in one of our reports, uh, the last report on comprehensive planning and public health. So I wanted to identify a few really kind of more um, hands-on examples. So before working at APA, I was with the Baltimore City Department of Transportation, and I did a health impact assessment on a new light rail line that we were building. Um, and I worked closely with the health department on getting the right data to include in the health impact assessment. And right when I was working there, they did for the first time, the health department did, for the first time, uh, develop a set of community health profiles. And they've updated them since then, so that was 2008. They've updated them in 2011. Um, here's a couple of examples uh, from, from those set of reports. I believe there's 55 reports, and they're based on the community statistical area. You can see the map on the left. Um, community statistical areas in the city. And the wonderful thing about these reports being based around data in the community statistical area is those are the same exact groupings that the planning department uses. So the planning department looks at data by community statistical area. They look at neighborhoods in that, at that level. Um, so you can very easily pair the data from the health department with the efforts of the planning department. And that's one of the most important things with data is having it at the right scale. Um, somebody mentioned zip codes. One of the previous speakers mentioned zip codes. And zip codes are actually the, one of the worst ways to look at data because they cross multiple jurisdictions. And so, for example, when I was looking at asthma data, um, the health department, because they got it from hospitals when kids would come in with asthma attacks, um, the hospitals collected the data by zip code which is fine if you're only looking at data by zip code, but obviously the Baltimore City Health Department doesn't look at data by zip code because the zip codes cross into the counties surrounding it. So um, the wonderful thing about this was it did count data by these same areas. These are, I'm sorry, I apologize for the blurriness of this map, but these are the um, larger groupings of smaller community statistical areas that are the Baltimore City's planning jurisdiction. So say the northeast corner, um, is made up of maybe 20 community statistical areas, 15 areas um, blocked off by city streets that probably aren't going anywhere. And this is the life expectancy map that they came up with um, broadly for the whole city. And you can see the extreme differential of life expectancy. They have figured out that in the red areas, life expectancy was as low as 63 years for, as an average for the whole population in those neighborhoods, whereas in the green areas, the life expectancy was as high as 83 years, which is a 20-year life differential in the same city within a couple of miles of each other, illustrating the effects of chronic long-term poverty and disenfranchisement of a significant population in that city. Uh, and then more recently, um, in partnership with the city and uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, they put together a map of the Baltimore City food environment. And you can see that a number of areas are identified as food deserts. And that is, as Lisa mentioned, a, an area where there is not a grocery store within half a mile of someone's residence. And you can see the power of mapping this information rather than just um, talking about it or having a picture of it. I think that the pictures of a neighborhood of this is where I buy food and it's a picture of a corner store with a bulletproof glass window is very illustrative. But once you see it on a map and you can see that it's not just that one neighborhood, but hundreds of neighborhoods throughout one city, you can have a better sense of, of what you're dealing with. And, um, and so pictorial descriptions of data, I think, are, are really, really important and very persuasive. And this is something that you can give to your elected official or uh, on city council or the mayor or their staff people and say, this is what we're dealing with. These are, these are the people, why they're hungry or malnourished or unwell, this is one of the factors here, is that they don't have access to a grocery store and this is visually told. Um, I believe that the yellow dots are the grocery stores that exist. Um, and you can see that, of course, the areas in red that are food deserts are very similar to the areas in red for life expectancy. This is another example of a very different city, potentially, um, but 
one closer to here that probably many people have been to. Um, this is, I, I have to credit the Georgia Tech um, and the Atlanta Planning Department for this couple of slides here on the Atlanta's Neighborhood Quality of Life and Health Project, which is a, a really interesting multidisciplinary project. If, has anybody checked this out or seen this before by any chance? Uh, I encourage all of you to go look at it. It's super cool. It's an interactive website. It basically does on, at your own pace the kinds of data I just showed you from Baltimore. So a couple of, couple of slides walking you through this. Um, they have 25 neighborhood planning units in Atlanta. And um, the indicators for this project relate to a number of the fields planners work directly in. So they took objective indicators like socioeconomic status, uh, other census data, um, other types of built environment data, put it together with resident perception. So do people perceive that their neighborhood is unsafe? Do people perceive that they can't buy fresh food in their neighborhood? And they came up with this sort of combined um, layering of data. So here's some quality of life indicators. So what are the amenities in the neighborhood? Uh, what's the economy like? Housing, public safety, you can see them listed here. And then the specific indicators and measures that they were looking at for those categories. And again, you can see that the areas where um, they that scored highly for the quality of life um, are geographically bound. They're not scattered throughout the city. You don't have a a neighborhood that has great quality of life here, and then here, and then here. Yeah, they're concentrated, um, as, as is the case with the uh, areas for low quality of life. Um, and then this is the group of health indicators that they put together. Nutrition, physical activity, um, and then some really objective ones, morbidity, morbidity and mortality. Sorry, that years of potential life loss is an interesting measure because it, it shows the the amount of time and the amount of potential that a life could have had to contribute to society, to contribute to a family, to enjoy happiness, and, and showing that that potential has been lost early or um, because, generally early, <laughs> um, because of some adverse impact generally in the environment, um, or if we think of the environment more broadly of including the food environment or physical activity opportunities that we can think about the sort of, to go back to what I was talking about at the beginning with um, how we're actually hurting ourselves and hurting the potential of our own country by not looking at these things in a more direct way. But looking at um, Atlanta and how they came up, again, very similarly on the health side as the overall quality of life side, the neighborhoods in the northern part of town scored really well. The neighborhoods um, in the center part of the city scored relatively low, and, um, and then there's some middle ranking areas as well. They did a, an interesting thing here too. They actually ranked every single neighborhood. So when you go on the website, you can look and see how each neighborhood, uh, NPU neighborhood planning unit, um, is ranked. And again, obviously neighborhood planning unit and health data, they put the data at the same scale as what the planning department uses, so they can make decisions and prioritize investments based on health data as well as other built environment metrics that they're looking at. I'll let you look at this one on your own. So the, the last area that I wanted to talk about before going into a new project that APA is doing um, is health impact assessment and planning. And how many people have worked on a health impact assessment or looked at a health impact assessment? You can tell I like you to raise your hands and wake up a little bit. OK. So it's something that's fairly familiar to some folks. Um, it's a, it's a way to bring together health data and a planning decision, whether it be a project or a program or a new highway that's being built or whatever it may be. In the case of the project I did, it was a transit line, as I mentioned. Um, in many cases, it's something like, um, should school lunches be required to include a vegetable? That, there was a health impact assessment done on that legislation in California several years ago. So it's, it's done on a number of different types of things. Uh, APA has a free online course in health impact assessment that you can take if you like. You can find it on our website. Um, it's a six module course. I encourage folks to take it and get familiar with health impact assessment. It's a great tool to even just illustrate the connections between whatever project or plan you're working on and the health impact. Um, 
And it builds capacity for planners to include health promoting elements in whatever you're doing. So um, well, I don't think it should be regulated for, or it, that HIA should be a regulation, that you should do it on every single thing. I don't want to create another hoop like NEPA has turned into in many cases, but I think that thinking about health, if, if folks are not thinking about health, this can be used as kind of a, a leverage to encourage them to think about health. So I'm going to walk you through a few tools and resources that we have um, that we've compiled at APA <laughs> that we recommend that people look at. It, some of them are from CDC, like the Health Equity Guide from CDC uh, is a really great tool. It outlines specific interventions, a lot of them that relate to planning and planning actions um, to address health equity in the categories of um, chronic disease determinants, so active living, healthy eating, um, they cover tobacco, they cover access to clinical care and prevention services. The Community Guide is a similar resource, also from the CDC. Uh, this brings in more data, it's a little bit more academic. It, if you want to find out the exact right way to address, um, uh, to develop a program so that people of a certain age will eat their vegetables, this is maybe a better resource for you. Um, maybe less so for planners than the previous one, but still another resource to look at. Community Commons is a, a really neat interactive website. Um, if your community hasn't done what Atlanta did, uh, which is actually a really big undertaking on their part to do that, um, Community Commons is a nice shortcut to that. It's similar to the county health rankings with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has put together, but you can look at different factors here, and it can go down to a smaller census level than just the county. And then uh, another resource also in collaboration with Georgia Tech is the Built Environment and Public Health Clearinghouse, which APA has actually worked on a little bit. It's one of the outcomes of our partnership with the Surgeon General's Office and the National Prevention Strategy, coming up with more resources to help with prevention. Um, this is a, a clearinghouse which has everything from public health and planning curricula and articles and books that you should look at if you're interested in the topics of public health and planning to um, the different fields of the built environment, architecture, landscape architecture, um, more on planning, more on HIA, and then of course public health. And one of the um, wonderful tools that I think is great is this glossary which has I think more than 1,100 terms in it covering planning, public health, architecture, et cetera. So if you don't know what a term means in public health because it's not your field and you're not familiar with it, you can go and look in this glossary and it will give you a wonderful definition and um, that's been vetted by academics and, and you can better understand and better teach all of your friends about what that means. So that ends all of what we've been doing and some of the best examples that I think um, you can look to for modeling maybe in your own community of Orlando or other places that you might be working or where you might be going later. Um, and now I want to talk about a little bit about what APA is coming up to. So I mentioned that a lot of our funding had come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to do some research in the past. Well, for the first time, APA has won an award from CDC to actually dispense funding, which is We've never done it before, so we're figuring out how to do it as we go. But um, the goal is to improve the capacity of planning and public health to in implement community-based strategies to address the four main determinants of chronic disease. And we're working through our chapters and in partnership with the American Public Health Association. So the four areas, we've mentioned them a bunch tonight, but just to illustrate them once again, inactivity, unhealthy diet, smoking, and not actually being able to get to the doctor are the four main reasons that CDC has determined that people have chronic disease. So we'll be able to support 30 to 40 coalitions around the United States, again, in partnership with the American Public Health Association. So we have chapters around the country, which 
I hope most of you are members of our chapter here in Florida. Um, and APHA has similarly affiliates around the country. And so these coalitions will be um, in partnership with those two organizations and hopefully lots of other organizations as well. People, other stakeholders that have an influence in this area, we want to be involved. And then we'll support with um, technical assistance and other kinds of guidance. So going back to some of those strategies that I identified from the health equity guide, um, the first resource mentioned, they're called policy systems and environment strategies. This is CDC's, part of CDC's new approach. It's no longer about education. It's no longer about individualized health behavior change. It's all about changing the systems, institutionalizing public health interventions at, the, at a higher, more policy-oriented level, rather than thinking that if we tell one person at a time to eat better, it's going to have an impact, because it hasn't. And so what they have seen, however, is policy change, everything from changing procurement policies of school systems to buy healthy foods to um, rules that actually facilitate the implementation of plans. So if it, it's not a regulation per se or a new policy, but it's a policy to more expedite, uh, to expedite the implementation of something um, and get plans, uh, trails on the ground faster. Um, systems, policy systems and environmental changes. So whatever you consider as part of the environment, whether it be um, the natural environment, so things like tree planting initiatives that have an impact on many more individuals and over a longer period of time than just one person. So in the short term, we want to have people understand what that means, which you can hear that I'm still figuring out how to explain it to people and still figuring out the language that's appropriate for each group and audience. Um, but we want to have a greater understanding in our among our membership and then among the people they're serving about what that means. Um, greater awareness among stakeholders about how planning decisions are made, how to bring health into the process, and just how planning and public health, and how planning in particular, is a public health initiative, and then increasing community capacity to actually bring these changes about. So that will have an educational component, but it will be more in the realm of educating decision makers and policy makers rather than educating individuals. In the long term, I wrote this statement and I still stand behind it. In the long term, we want to fully integrate planning and public health work leading to a healthier country. That's the aim. So here's a little bit more about PSEs. Um, policies updating or changing organizational rules with the aim to promote health or prevent disease. That can be everything from ordinances to motions to laws. Of course, we're not allowed to actually advocate for any particular law, but um, that's included here. Systems, interventions, and impact all elements of an organization, institute, or system, and that might be an economic system or a transportation system. And then environment interventions that involve changes to economic, social, or physical environments. Clearly, there's big overlap here. It's not um, one size fits all or one goes into each category and cleanly doesn't apply to the next. How do you get to the systems change? Well, you might need a policy. So, um, but that's, that's the fields that we're looking at and where we want folks to think about their own work. Obviously, planners are already thinking at this level. Planners are thinking in terms of systems. Planners are thinking in terms of environments. Obviously, planners have to think about policy all the time. Um, we think that these approaches are going to be the most successful, have the broadest reach, and ultimately be more cost effective than talking to one person at a time. This is a wonderful um, pictorial description, which maybe you can look at later in more detail uh, if you can see it okay, but uh, from the American Public Health Association, I credit them with this image. Um, it involves building partnerships. It involves looking at all of your options, determining what's the best, um, developing a plan, implementing, and then of course looking at what you've done and, and seeing how you can improve it next time. The funds that APA will be dispensing is, is not going to be a very long time, but we know that um, we know that people are going to have to figure out how to make it sustainable for the longer term. APHA also has a great resource on health and all policies. 
here's a bunch of links. I wasn't sure if this would be downloadable by you all or, or, or whatnot. So these are all hyperlinks for later. And then I want to close with a quote from our Surgeon General who spoke at APA's National Conference, which was in Atlanta this past year. Health starts at an individual level and progresses to a community level. We need to move the nation from a focus on sickness and disease to based, one based on prevention and wellness. This is a 21st century flag, and I call upon the APA to deputize planners to this mission. So I'm calling upon you and deputizing you and carrying that message forward to uh, bring health into all of the aspects of your work. And hopefully, I imagine a world where I won't have to come and talk to you about this because there will be so many people doing this kind of work and it will be so normal and so everyday that people won't talk about the integration of health and planning because it will just be how we do work. And it won't be a, a topic of remark. It will just be, oh, we're making a plan. Okay, we have to call the health department. We have to call the parks department. We have to call all the right people and talk about how we can address vulnerable populations and, address the, and help support the people who are most in need. And that will just be how we do things. So thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you. We are going to, thank you very much. We're going to turn now to some local perspectives and some answers. Um, your presentation really excites me about a lot of the work that's going on in Central Florida, from Get Active Orlando to Healthy Central Florida, which is an initiative of Florida Hospital and the Winter Park Health Foundation, the work going on in the Paramore community to plan for healthy community design there and the many collaborations together. We're truly bringing people to, together to support this type of work and having our university be at the center of it to support convenings like this to educate people about the importance and, and bringing them together is just really key to seeing us turn around these health trends for our community over the years. So thank you again and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce all of our panelists and then just let them come up one after one and do it in that sense to avoid this up down and keep us moving tonight. Um, our first panelist will be Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton. And Dr. Littleton is a strategic and visionary leader with more than 15 years of ex experience delivering healthcare services, evaluating community health programs, and conducting community-based participatory research. She's a lecturer in the School of Public Administration at UCF, and her area of expertise is health equity and seeking solutions to problems rooted um, in connections between health and neighborhood factors. Yes, she has a bachelor's degree in nursing, a master's in public administration from Louisiana State University, and a PhD in public affairs from the University of Central Florida. But I have to take a moment to also add, since yesterday was Veterans Day, and I received one of the most beautiful emails yesterday um, with a little bit of extra information, that Dr. Littleton also served in the U.S. Army as an enlisted soldier stationed in Baumholder, Germany, with the 8th Infantry Division Mechanized Artillery. Not a military person, so I hope I said that all right. In addition, her two sons and their father are military veterans. Her oldest son was in the Air Force, her youngest son in the Army, and their father also in the Army. Dr. Littleton says of her service, and I'm going to paraphrase to the end here, it is my belief that my willingness to serve others, my self-discipline, and my passion for community were all enhanced by my military service. So thank you for serving and for being here, Dr. Littleton. Mary Stewart Draghi has been a planner with the City of Orlando Planning Division for over 15 years. Her background is in health and federal funds administration as relates to community redevelopment. She's the Physical Environment and Public Policy Committee Chairperson for Get Active Orlando, an initiative that implements programs that support healthy lifestyle behaviors. And toward that, Get Active Orlando and through much of Mary's leadership and the leadership of other staff at the City of Orlando are really working to make our city a, a healthier, more sustainable and walkable community. And we thank them for that. It's really making a difference. Um, where was I? Mary holds a master's in urbanism from the University of Montreal and a master of health science from the University of Florida. She's lead accredited professional and member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. More importantly, Mary takes action on the issues she's passionate about and works together with her constituents to make Orlando and the surrounding region a healthier place to live. Thank you, Mary. Ken Peach is the executive director of the Health Council of East Central Florida, the health planning agency for Orlando and the Space Coast that is leading the way in providing information and planning on health and health care in our community. 
you're not familiar with it, be sure to connect with Ken and learn more. In some ways, it's our best kept secret for people outside of the health world. Before joining the Health Council in December 2010, he ran a medical practice business development company and a health insurance agency. From 85 to 2005, Ken was an administrator in hospitals, health systems, and senior living facilities. For two years, he was the American Hospital Association Regional Executive for Florida and Puerto Rico and Vice President integrated and vice president of integrated delivery systems with the Florida Hospital Association. A bachelor's in communication from Seton Hall University and an MBA with a health service administration degree from FIT, Florida Institute of Technology. So I would bring it back to Dr. Um, Littleton, please. Good evening. As she stated, I'm Dr. Vanessa Lopez Littleton, and I just love to hear them introduce me. I always sit over there and go, yay, I've done all that stuff, right? But tonight, I get to talk to you a little bit about my work, and I thought I'd start with the quote instead of ending with the quote. Um, Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And the reason I think that that's so profound, because I think that a lot of us know about a lot of issues, but we really don't really get active or really don't do anything about it. And so tonight I hope to say something that will set off that little spark in you that will motivate you to do something about some of these pressing issues in our community. And so the other part of that is willing is not enough, we must do. So your action and your activity is just as important as your knowledge. Um, I thought I'd add a couple more things about why me. Um, When I first came to Central Florida, I started working with the Health Care Center for the Homeless, and I was passionate about that cause for a number of years, and to this day, it's still one of those things that kind of drive me to do what I do. But in addition to that, I always fall back on my health care background because I am a registered nurse. And the thing that um, puts me in a place that makes me a little bit different than most people is my background. I actually am a product of the Civil Rights era, and I actually was born the year Martin Luther King died. And a lot of people don't know that, and they say, well, why is that important? Because you always think of that as something that happened a very, very long time ago. But I'm going to give you some data, I'm going to give you some numbers, and talk about years in a little bit that will bring some of these things into perspective. So as we talk a little bit more about health, you'll understand why it's important, and why it's even more important for African Americans, because the plight of African Americans and our health is a lot different than most people that are sitting in this room today. So I'll talk about some of those things. But as far as me and why me, some of my research that I'm doing currently, I'm working on a project with the Orange County Health Department evaluating the effectiveness of some of their programs looking at health equity. I am working with the NIJ grant, um, the National Institute of Justice, looking at mental health services in Brevard County Public Schools, where we'll be evaluating um, mental health services in the public school system. I'm working with the West Orange Health District, looking at a variety of nonprofits and hospitals and their impact on public health. I'm working on a healthcare innovation grant as a new project with the Children's Home Society, where we'll be looking to evaluate outcomes of the Evans Community School. I'm working with Partners in Health. It's an international nonprofit organization that seeks to improve the health of women and children in Haiti. That's my focus. I also have a project that I proposed last year with April Fisher, who's here tonight, to analyze the social and economic influences on infant mortality in, um, can't remember the name of the community, help me. Bithlow, Bithlow, wow. I know, it's okay, it's okay. Um, So I've got all these projects going on, and the bottom line is I'm very interested in improving health outcomes, not just for racial ethnic minorities, but for all people who are disadvantaged. And it's very unique for us to have this opportunity to talk about poverty and the impact of planning on poverty and poverty on planning. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. The question why you is as planners, everyone has a role. and a. And in all honesty, you guys have an even more important and valuable role because you're talking about designing communities, improving communities that will ultimately have an impact on health, which is the bottom line here tonight. And why not? That's the question. Why not? Why not get involved and care about these issues? I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the context of improving health and as it relates to poverty. As we know, there's been a lot of changes recently in the healthcare system most importantly has been the Affordable Care Act. Well, why is that important? Because now everyone has access to health care, right? Everyone, poor people, rich people, everyone alike can go to the doctor now, right, under the Affordable Care Act. 
Absolutely not, right? We still know that there is a large population right now who still don't have health insurance. Some people say, I'd rather pay the penalty as opposed to going out and actually getting health insurance and trying to, to work through that system. Um, we know that even when African Americans go to the doctor, that there's biases and other issues that create um, prejudices, that create um, disadvantage for blacks in that, in that space. So what can we do to improve that? So there, um, oh, there are issues that are um, in the current healthcare system that have created issues as well. The changing demographics. By 2043, the United States Census Bureau estimates that we will be a majority minority community. What that, I mean not community, nation. So what that means is that as a nation, we will have issues related to minority health that we need to address. And not just in the sector of health, but across all, uh, because, I mean, across all se sectors. Sorry, guys got me a little nervous here. The economic climate. Um, so I think Lisa talked about 37.2% of people in the, in the region are below the federal poverty level. That's a lot of people in the Central Florida region who are below that level. So the economic climate, the recession of 2009, and the slow economic recovery since that time, all of those things have an impact. Changing in the built environment. When I started putting this lecture together, I started thinking about some of the things that relate to transportation that have created barriers um, to people accessing healthcare. And I thought about I-4, so I had the opportunity to do a little bit of research. And it took me about three minutes to come across an article, and I'll read just a little excerpt of it. It says, to this day, the area west of I-4 is primarily inhabited by African Americans, and the difference in housing and facilities between this area and the downtown area is quite notable. As a matter of fact, the very name Division Street points to a distinct historical line of demarcation between black and white residential areas. During segregation, white physicians did not treat African American patients. African American doctors therefore earned their money from people of their own race. And you can look, there's a, the Wells Built Museum is a historical museum in downtown Orlando that um, still display some of the work that Dr. Wells di did in that area where he delivered over 5,000 babies um, in his home. So there are some areas in downtown Orlando that perpetuate some of the issues that hopefully I'll be able to talk to you about a little bit about today. So the changing in the built environment. In technolo technological advances, one of the things we know is that 47% of people believe their neighborhood is not safe. So there are some issues, oh, I'm sorry, oh, that's about the changing in the built environment. The technological advances, we know that there is a digital divide. We know that poor people are more likely not to have access to the internet. They don't have access to other information and resources that we kind of take for granted. So we use that information and resources that we have access to where poor people don't have the abilities to do those things. The context of improving health, looking at social issues. Income inequality is a big issue in the United States. I think I saw a report the other day that said over 95% of the nation's wealth is in the hands of a very small majority, I mean, a very small number of people in the United States. When you have such a divide like that, when you think about the implications for the people who are left out, some people want to focus on the middle class and say, what about the middle class? What about the people who are at the far ends of that spectrum? So how can we develop systems and processes whereby everyone has the access and the opportunity to good health and good health outcomes? Disparities in education. It's one of those things that's most troubling. I recently heard that in DC, they've now given cameras to some of the students to document, to reflect some of the different issues that are going on in their schools. And I actually put, um, put together a PowerPoint slide and I showed it to a couple of people at a conference I was recently attending in um, Philadelphia. And I said, can you tell me what this is a picture of? And when they looked at it, they said, oh, that's jail. Oh, that's prison. And I'm like, no, that's a public school. And so when I hear Lisa tell her story about her life growing up, and then I look and I see something like these, these kids are going through metal detectors, they've got all these, um, they've got bars on the windows, they've got you know layers of protection at the school so that if you get through the first one, maybe we'll catch you through the second one, and if not, definitely the third. Um, there was one picture of a young man sitting in a hallway, and you know he had on, I don't wanna say, something that looked like prison garb, but in all honesty, it was actually his school uniform, and the feel of the, the, the picture, you know, 
know, there's a relationship between, they call it the school to prison pipeline. So how do we educate kids and how do we implement our policies when children are faced with situations such as that? So when you're um, looking at these issues, it's hard to talk about health and just improving health outcomes without having an understanding that all of these different things play a role. So you're talking about transportation, you're talking about the highway, you're talking about visual and mental divisions between people. So you can actually stand at a point in downtown Orlando and look and see what housing looked like, <coughs> what services look like on one side of the street, and then look at the other side and see what's available. And it's not the same. Um, I recently took a tour with the poverty group and it was, it was on erasing um, poverty and it was, um, no, sorry, erasing um, racism. And one of the things that was most profound is that we took a tour of downtown Orlando and we got to a point where we went on Central and we went under the I-4 overpass. And I remember seeing park benches, people were sitting out playing checkers. Um, there was a lady with a stroller and I assume it was a baby in there. So all of these things were happening underneath the highway. And I was thinking to myself, where would you ever see a situation like this in a white community? Why is this acceptable in a black community? Is this acceptable in a black community? And so when we're thinking about policies, we're thinking about the built community, we've got to think about the impact that we have on people's lives. So yes, it sounds good to say, oh, well, we gave them a place to you know, communicate and to, to, to hang out and where someone can come and feed them underneath there. But is that a good place environmentally? I mean, you've got the fumes from two highways, two major highways um, buzzing overhead. So all of those different things come into play in, in, on health. So I just wanted to mention that. So when we talk about health disparities, health disparities, when we talk about it, is the difference in which disadvantaged social groups systematically experience worse health, out, health and greater health risk than other social groups. Most of these um, disparities um, are unfair, they're preventable, and it's been shown that they're, um, they're unjust. So when we talk about social justice, these are the types of issues that we are addressing. In regards to the legacy of health disparities in the United States, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, each year, there are more than 80,000 excess black deaths and, I mean, and 3,000 excess black infant deaths. That's over and above what's expected. And we do a pretty good job of predicting deaths for populations. And so when we think about it, that to me is a lot. And we've only been 151 years since the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863. There's only been 50 years since um, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So what that says is that, is there a slave health deficit from the Jim Crow era, from all those years of being disenfranchised, of not having access to health care, health services, equitable health care? There, there is a slave health deficit, and that's okay. So it, once we acknowledge that it's okay, it's what do we do about it? How do we fix it going forward? So I present this slide to you to say that it's my hypotheses and some of the things that I've been working on in my research to say that you know in the healthcare field, we've done everything, well not everything, but most of the things that we could to drive down some of these different indicators. So once we've done that, why is that gap still there? So why do black babies still die at a greater rate than white babies? And I hypothesize that there are social issues. There are things that are going on in the built environment. There are social, um, there's institutionalized racism in some of our policies, in our practices, in our public health approach to different things. So that's what I envision as keeping those two um, indicators so far apart. So here we go with the health and all policies. Well, what is it and how do we do it? Well, first we have to get all the key players at the table and have them to understand their roles and their perspectives. And so in looking at this, you'll see academic institutions kind of at the end. Well, academic institutions have a phenomenal opportunity to leverage all of these partners and get these people at the table because of the way that academic institu institutions are perceived. So we call them anchor institutions because they are that thrust in that community. So as Anna described, health and all policies approach, these are some of the critical elements. There's no one way to approach a health and all policies approach. These steps that are listed here are one strategy and one um, approach to doing it, but promoting health and health equity and, sustainable, uh, and sustainability are key factors and key approaches that you have to do kind of as a primary step. 
and then supporting intersectorial collaboration. Getting all those key partners at the table, so planning and zoning, all of those um, transportation, all the other things that I had listed, housing, criminal justice, they all have a role to play and they're all just as important. And one of the last things I'll leave you with is this is a picture uh, of Lee Jeffries that was done by Bob Codges, one of my good friends who's worked for many years at the Healthcare Center for the Homeless, of a homeless man in downtown Orlando. And it's unfortunate that a lot of times that we're doing our planning and we're talking, we leave out populations that don't have a voice. And as we know, homeless populations typically don't have a voice. But we also know that a lot of our racial ethnic minorities, they don't vote they don't get involved in policy, they won't come to your meetings. So how do you reach out to a community that's so disengaged? You have to create strategies. I really don't like the saying, if we build it, they will come. You need to create different models where people are more engaged on the front end and we're not just dumping things out, giving them what we think that we want, that they want, All right, that's gonna work for them. And we'll talk about this later as far as what can planners do, some of my strategies and suggestions for that as well. But that's it, I'll wrap up. <laughs> Before I touch on my experience with um, health impact assessments and certain health-related activities at the City of Orlando, I've been asked to provide a little bit of background um, as to what spurred my interest in this area. Looking back, I'd have to say that my interest in health and the built environment emerged while studying as an occupational therapy student, grappling with a theory entitled The Model of Human Occupation, which is shown before you on the screen. The theory embodied the very essence of the profession, which had often escaped a clear definition. OT, or occupational therapy, and its most basic terms, addresses a wide range of elements from the physical to the spiritual, as well as various environmental components. This slide actually shows the interplay between these elements, tying together the physical well-being and the environmental quality of life which all contribute to what's called activities of daily living or what's commonly known as the field is um, occupational performance. Uh, my entrance into health and planning was through my participation in Get Active Orlando, which is an initiative of the City of Orlando. First established in 2003, it was funded through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Get Active um, promotes, as Lisa mentioned earlier, active living by design and healthy eating. It's been led for over 10 years by Director Dean Grandin, and it has been supported by a great many um, different community partners and its holistic 5P community action model process. And over the years, it's proven to be fairly successful and it's had a wide range of impacts. In fact, a number of Get Active Orlando's activities and um, projects and activities were actually addressed in this article that you see in front of you. It's in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, and it proved to be um, very well received. And then one of the um, projects or programs that was featured was a senior walking group that you're seeing here. Uh, Get Active has also proven to be an area of study, a formal study, I should say, and this is just a snapshot of a, a portion of an article announcing uh, funding from the NIH to the UCF College of Nursing to analyze the benefits of Get Active Orlando's programming, which included walking and biking as well as community gardening. And then finally, I'd like to add that Get Active also triggered a number of changes in our growth management plan, namely to add some Get Active um, principles, and it actually led to, to a checklist, and I apologize for the quality of the checklist that's shown to your right, but what it is, it's something that we add to our municipal planning board applications. And what it does, it encourages applicants to incorporate active living elements into their development proposals. And indeed, it was my involvement in Get Active that led me to become involved in health impact assessments. Um, a health impact assessment, as Anna reviewed here recently, is simply a tool that helps planners and policymakers objectively evaluate the potential health effects of a policy or project before it is built or implemented. Um, I think what makes health impact assessments um, unique and valuable is that they embody certain values such as democracy and equity as well as excellence in research. 
and as importantly through their implementation, they increase an overall awareness of broad-based health issues. Time uh, really doesn't permit me to go into all of this detail that you're seeing on the screen in front of you, but I'd like to note that it is um, an HI involves a prescribed uh, grouping or range of activities, ranging, if you look from the bottom of the screen, to screening all the way through to monitoring, and ideally it's embedded within a public participation framework. An important part of this whole process is something called a logic model that hopefully one develops pretty early on in the process. Um, and it really addresses the potential health effects of a plan or a project. And I'm just showing here as an example with complete streets that um, ultimately, um, if well planned, leads to greater multimodal access and ultimately, one would hope, positive health outcomes such as reduction of asthma and an increase in health equity. In 2013, um, the city had an opportunity to become involved in a health um, impact assessment, and that involved the Lock Haven Park Improvement Plan. And many of you here are familiar with Lock Haven. It has historically served as a hub for the city and the region, um, culturally and recreationally, but more recently has struggled to find its place. Um, there was a plan that was spearheaded by a staff person by the name of Jason Burton, and involved both physical and programmatic improvements. The HIA was led by an individual by the name of Tara McHugh. She's the Director of Planning at the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. And the health um, outcomes included social capital, economic security, physical health, and safety. Um, this HIA involved a lot of work. Uh, it involved both primary and secondary research. Um, hundreds and hundreds of surveys were done and countless site visits. The findings and the recommendations were presented um, at two public meetings, one being a stakeholder charrette and the other being a more formal public meeting. And I would say overall the recommendations were well received and they elicited a lot of discussion concerning health. There were lessons learned though from this entire process, um, namely as you can see on the left hand side of the screen that there was a lot of positives from it. It was a good community engagement tool and increased awareness of health, as well as certain um, new rationales for justifying additional lighting and sidewalks. On the other side of it though, um, it is very time consuming. There are um, pretty considerable costs. Data at times can be challenging to collect. And I would say that at times there was issues related to role delineation and partner involvement. And in speaking to Tara, we both concluded that HIAs obviously are very valuable, but should be used strategically, and I'm speaking of the larger ones, obviously, when there's appropriate partners, expertise, and funds. And here I've just included a slide with some resources that can be available after the session. And I'd just like to move on to a very exciting project that I had um, an opportunity to be involved with. And it is called the Comprehensive Paramore Neighborhood Plan. And it was led by Paul Lewis at the City of Orlando in partnership with Jim Sellen and Kurt Estroika at VHB. And we've spoken a little bit, um, previous speakers have, about Paramore. Um, it's a historical low moderate income neighborhood just west of downtown. And over the years it's gradually lost its population and struggled for lack of a better um, term for its footing even with decades of public and private investment. Um, what's really notable is the physical health of its residents, particularly its children. Um, it's very poor. Um, a large number report some type of medical condition. The plan focuses on a healthy community, making it easier for people to live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, the planning effort started uh, way back in the fall of 2013 and it involved a very extensive public participation uh, process. It was impressive by the number of people that were involved in this overall planning effort. The result was a vision for Paramore with recommendations at a short, mid, and long term, and it is anticipated to be approved early next year. Excuse me, early next year. Um, I'd like to add that a Dr. Richard Jackson that many of you here are familiar with he is an individual responsible for a series called Designing Healthy Places. He's also the Chair of Environmental Health Sciences at the School of Public Health at UCLA. And he was actively involved in this entire process. 
Um, the framework of the plan includes what's called 10 big ideas. Uh, and this was also developed in part at the um, Urban Land Institute session. And these ideas are shown on the screen in front of you, and I'm not going to read all of them, but I will call out a number of them that I find are interesting, such as promoting social and environmental justice, making education the cornerstone of revitalization, promoting access to healthy food, and encouraging mixed-use development, just to name a few. It's hoped through embracing these 10 big ideas and the associated projects and programs that ultimately this will be the catalyst for a healthier and more vibrant Paramore. Um, this slide in front of you addresses an HIA that was done on the Paramore neighborhood, done concurrently um, with the planning process, but separate from. It was conducted by a number of grad students, a number of which I believe are in attendance here at this session, in the Healthy Community Design course under the guidance of Lisa Portelli and assistance from Sarah Stack. And the purpose of the HIA was to determine the impact of traffic-related pollution on the asthma rates of residents in Paramore. And just briefly going through this, um, I understood that the students were engaged in an extensive comprehensive literature review um, on people in the area that were subject to traffic-related asthma. Um, they looked at code enforcement violations as well as the quality of the housing stock. And moving on, I'd like to add, they, they uh, provided a number of very practical recommendations for creating an environment that contributes to the health and well-being of Paramore. And I'd like to leave you with a final comment, and this was something that I picked up from the Paramore plan. And I'd just like to read this out. Children grow up assuming that they're the kind of person that their physical environment tells them they are. They see the physical environment as a portrait of themselves, an ugly, brutal environment that has a deadening effect. We have the responsibility to create an environment in which they can feel at home and find their special places. It should be possible to children to get to know their community inside and out and to hold their community in the palm of their hand. They are, after all, the ones who will inherit the Paramore community and become responsible for its future. Thank you. Okay, we got our slides ready here for the next segment. I want to share with you, I mean, I'm so impressed by the knowledge of the individuals that spoke this evening. And I'm sitting here thinking, I did a lousy job raising my kids. Um, because um, I spent so much time with them as a hobby, helping them look at planning and ideas and community design. We went out to community events and activities as they were growing up. And what's happened, uh, it's lousy because they've all traveled somewhere else. I've got one living in Philadelphia, one living in Washington, D.C., who just sold his car, doesn't need it. And so um, even though my background happens to be healthcare, I've spent a lot of time looking at planning from the standpoint of a parent and from the standpoint of someone who lives in a community and says, okay, what are we gonna do in the future? Particularly as my generation of baby boomers moves to the point where they are no longer have the mobility that they had before. How are they gonna get to healthcare services? Um, and so um, in so many ways, this was a great opportunity tonight to, to look at these, uh, these two aspects of, of care. Um, and what it means to, uh, to try and build a healthy community. Um, as was shared before, the Health Council is a health planning agency for the Central Florida area, Orange, Osceola, Seminole, and Brevard counties. Uh, formed by the state statutes back in the 1980s uh, for a variety of reasons, but looking at how do we plan for health in our communities. And I'm intrigued because the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, when I first got their 2060 plan, I noticed the piece missing was there was no chapter related to health. And they have shared with me at the time they put it together that their leadership, their community leaders, didn't understand why health should belong in a planning document. So I believe we've come a long way. We work very closely with that organization now in trying to do things together and bring the regional planning together uh, with uh, planning from a health standpoint. Um, I wanted to share with you, and let me see, let's just go ahead and we'll do it the easy way here, I think. Okay. Um, I call it the two-step dance. How many of you are familiar with the Prevention Institute in California? 
they've done some really intriguing work in this area, and they use something that we've kind of adopted locally as we look at planning efforts, uh, and that is the two-step back look. So let's take a look, for example, at an individual with diabetes who now sits in the lower left-hand corner here, unfortunately with amputation because of um, uh, the diabetes injury to the circulation, and they've lost uh, part of their, their left leg. Well, if we step one back, we look at the healthcare services, and that's the hospital care that they get, the clinic care, and those things that are there to take care of their diabetes. But if we take yet another step back, we look at the exposures and behaviors that could have helped them avoid that amputation. So for example, in this case, it's something related to food deserts or related, for example, to access to healthy food or areas of high concentration of fast food. And maybe if we had done something to help them with nutrition, they would not have become a little bit on the obese side, which leads to, and so often to diabetes. The other thing is maybe if they'd been gotten, gotten out and gotten an opportunity to be more physically active, that would have helped them as well. But indeed, if we take the second step back to the environment, that means we need safe parks and communities where they can go out and get that exercise and activity. Now, as Anna mentioned uh, earlier, she talked about comprehensive plan shortfalls. There were three. Uh, food and nutrition is uh, not appearing in, in many of the plans that were evaluated. Uh, mental health um, and then also mapping. So I want to share with you um, as we go through here um, how some of these things relate to this. So you can clearly see that we do look at nutrition when it comes to um, enabling people to change their behavior. The next area I wanted to share is the detailed data that's available. So when we talk about mapping, here's some examples that have been done. And, and again, you'll have to look at the close-up view later on. I put the source information at the bottom. But a, a number of, uh, back in actually two years ago, um, health and hospitals and health networks took a look at what was happening in Camden, New Jersey. In Camden, they identified uh, first areas of high concentration from a policing standpoint. They noticed that certain crimes happen in certain clusters and certain areas of the city. They mapped those, and it happened to be a physician saw this and said, you know, I wonder if we could do the same thing by mapping what is wrong with our population health-wise in certain areas. And so what they did is they mapped it, and this is an example of the article on the left-hand side, and they generated the concept of hot spotting. Um, and in healthcare right now, in the last few years, a lot of us are talking about hot spotting. Where are those areas of concentration, of whether it be diabetes or congestive heart failure uh, or, or other uh, types of health conditions? Why is it that they seem to happen in certain areas? And if we can use the two step back, let's go back and find the root cause and let's make an impact when we plan for that community. So, hot spotting has become a very good area for looking at detailed data. We just recently did some hot spotting analysis in Seminole County using uh, cluster data to look at where were the areas of high population vulnerability and what could we do in those particular areas. The second is healthy communities networks. Um, a number of years ago, as we helped the public health departments complete their map planning, which generates what they call their CHAWS and their CHIPS, Community Health Assessment, which drives a Community Health Improvement Plan, and I'll show you a couple in just a few minutes. As we looked at those, we said, okay, is there a way um, that we can gather this information and put it out there where it's accessible to everyone? And then, at the same time, working with the hospitals, the not-for-profit hospitals in the, across the country now under the Affordable Care Act are required to prove that they deserve not-for-profit status. And in order to do that, there is a process that they go underway, and it starts out with a community health needs assessment. And then additionally, it requires strategic implementation and an effort, an ongoing effort, to improve community health and community benefits. So we gave them that. Uh, and part of that was helping them create the community health needs assessments. We did 21 out of the 22 not-for-profit hospitals in the area. Nemours Children's Hospital was too new at that point in time. We took that information, we put it out on a network, and I've given you the web address on the bottom. If you go out to Healthy Measures, you will see 100, over 100 indicators of quality related to the, the health care determinants that were discussed earlier tonight. We have transportation there, we have the environment, we have jobs, we have education all the factors that impact health. And you can see where we're doing, how are we doing, how are we performing over time and against the 2020 Healthy People target um, that applies to these areas as well. There's a lot of other information out there, but the point is this is good information as you plan 
take a look at that website. And the third area is geodemography. This is a new area we're beginning to work with at uh, Rollins um, College uh, with them in the area of using what is traditional cluster data. Many of you know, if you go back a uh, ways, that uh, there were books uh, before 2000, another book in 2000 on cluster for the United States, taking joint homogenous populations, identifying what's unique about them, how they shop, um, uh, how they vote, uh, so much of this is now used as a science to help identify by what cluster you're in, what are the characteristics of that population. And so we've also, as had been done once before, been using geodemography now on ways that we can look at clusters in our communities and identify the health utilization. Uh, this is not new. Uh, I was a hospital administrator back in the 1990s. I like to say I'm a recovering hospital administrator. Um, but one of the things that we looked at was the ability for me to forecast demand. So for example, if I wanted to build volume for my cardiology program at South Seminole Hospital, I had the ability to go out and look at Markham Woods Road and tell you that based on population living in those areas, they had a high propensity for whether it was type of cancer or, cardi or cardiac condition. Even then, I could look at that information and forecast building demand for the hospital services. Of course, since that time, I've become enlightened and I do everything to keep you out of the hospital, but that's another story. So these are some of the data elements that are currently we're using, and how are we using them? Uh, first of all, I want to share Harmony, and I see that we've got somebody else here, but uh, two of us in the room were actually on the uh, Board of Supervisors for the Community Development District. We had a chance to build the community of Harmony from back when, as I say, the cows voted me on there because there was nobody else on the ranch at the time. Uh, but we served, I served for eight years on that board, and we had a chance to build a community with the idea that both uh, animal life and nature, especially not only if preserved, but it encouraged planting trees and things, that that could impact human health. Now, it was a bit of a guess, uh, but from a planning standpoint, there were some key characteristics of new urbanism type planning in that community, protecting the, the land around it. Most of you are probably familiar with Harmony. And just a week and a half ago, uh, the Harmony Institute gave a million dollar check to the University of Central Florida Medical School to create a three-year study that will be done to actually determine and prove some of the uh, characteristics or the, the things we're talking about, the impact uh, of the environment on human health. So it's kind of exciting to have that locally. Another great example is West Orange Trail. And for those of you who have uh, not seen it in the most recent edition of Florida Trend Magazine, there's a full last page article by uh, Mark Howard, editor's page on pedals. Let me just share with you the town, this is Winter Garden, has leveraged the trail's presence in redeveloping its historic center into one of the most charming, energetic, and down-to-earth small downtowns in the state. The occupancy rate for downtown buildings is more than 90% with a great mix of shops and restaurants. As someone who lived in Winter Garden back in the late 80s and early 90s and walked downtown and had to step around the broken glass in the buildings, it's incredible turnaround in Winter Garden. There's an example of planning and health by using a cycle and a bikeway, the West Orange Trail, to build the economy in that community. I worked for a hospital for a while that had two sets of people on the leadership council. They either were all RNs and MDs or they were CPAs. And so I learned to speak both languages. So when you're planning, you have to do the same thing. We, it's, we would love to create some things, but we have to find a financial reason to do it as well. And some of the opportunities to do that from a financial standpoint um, that I wanted to share with you are look at other sources of support. Um, for example, I worked with a guy a few years ago who was building the Alpo Dog Park in the Miami area, found a corporate sponsor to build and equip a park. So there's a way we have to look out there for that opportunity. Another is developers. A developer like the general partners, the lenses who helped to build the concept of Harmony, um, those were people who understood that there was a greater internal rate of return in that community if they could do it right. So there was also not only the heart of building a community like that, protecting the wildlife, but also the knowledge that we could build a business model from that as well. 
Finally, I want to mention Rock and Embrace. Rock is Redu Reduce Obesity in Central Florida Kids. Um, that program has been running a number of years now, putting $100,000 a year into the Paramore community that was mentioned before to build community gardens and resources there. Uh, this funded by uh, a foundation of an insurance company, Florida Blue Foundation. So again, finding the resources, if you can come up with ways to plan and build and find ways to reduce obesity by improving the, the economy and the, and the environment, uh, certainly a, a good mix. Finally, I want to share with you, base your planning on what's already been done. Uh, this is an example, as I mentioned before, of the community health needs assessment that was done in this particular case by all of the nonprofit hospitals in the Tri-County area, Metro Orlando. Over here on the right, we have the community health improvement plan, all of the public health departments in the state of Florida. In Florida, we have one that has 67 different offices around the state, um, and they're all required to do accreditation. So they're all out there looking at ways that they can put these plans into place and actually move forward in improving their, the health of their communities. Um, I also wanted to mention that I did show here is we just recently completed a 94 page, the first one that I'm aware of in Central Florida, uh, mental health study as well, uh, looking through the data and saying, okay, what are the issues related to mental health? We talked about chronic care briefly before. Most chronic care, 60% at least, according to the statistics, is linked to also some sort of mental issue. So we have a major problem. We cannot uh, exclude the focus on mental health as we look at physical health in this as well. So wrapping up, I just wanted to share, and back to what uh, Dr. Uh, Littleton had mentioned, whoops, a little bit too fast. Dr. Littleton had mentioned the fact that, you know, we are always dealing with health disparities, and that's an area that we spend a lot of time in as well at the Health Council. Thank you. But I did want to mention to you related to that um, something that the state developed a number of years ago called uh, Communities for a Lifetime. Most people don't know about that. It was developed actually in the area of the elderly affairs to say if we can develop a community that's good for seniors, it's also good for children and every, every other age. I would say the same thing. If we can begin to identify where are the opportunities to plan for healthier communities, we can apply that for those with the least resources and all of us, those with resources as well will benefit as a result. So my final quote here is, a job well begun is half done. Let's build on what it is that we know um, as we plan for healthier communities. Thank you.